What is going on you guys and welcome back to the channel. If you guys are new here, my name is Daniel Keller and I like to build cars. So if you clicked on this video, clearly you wanna know how to pull the engine out of your Subaru. And in today's video, I'm gonna show you how to do that on this 2002 Subaru WRX wagon. This is the new daily that I picked up for the winter because Stacy, our 500 horsepower STI hatchback, does not get driven in the snow. This car is built to the tilt and I don't wanna get all the salt and corrosion on the nice paint in this car. So this car is going to sit for the winter and then we get to rip around this nice WRX beater for the winter. But before we do that, we got a lot of work to do on this car. We got to pull the engine and do head gaskets, reseal the entire engine. I got to do coilovers all around. We got new rims and tires. We got to put new seats in it. There's a whole list of stuff we got to do to this thing. But in today's video, I'm not going to waste any more time. We're going to start by giving you guys a step-by-step -step guide on how to pull engines on Subarus. So the way that we're going to do this, since I have the car on flat ground right now, it's not on jack stands or anything like that yet. We're gonna start with pulling everything we can up top apart first. Then we're gonna get to the bottom, drain all the fluids and take everything apart on the bottom of the engine. So to get started up top, this car does have a cold air intake, which I will be reverting back to stock, most likely because this car is on the factory tune. And I don't like running any aftermarket parts on the car that affect the drivability if it is not tuned for it. So first thing we're gonna do is get the cold air intake pipe pulled out. We're gonna remove the battery and we're gonna remove this belt cover right here with your cruise control and throttle cable linkage. So on a stock battery, you're gonna have two 10 mils on each battery post. This car has aftermarket terminals on it. They look like 12 or 13 mils. And then you're gonna have your two 10 mils for the J hooks that mount the battery. Then on this intake pipe, we got a 10 mil T-bolt clamp and another mount down there that mounts under the upper coolant reservoir. And we also have to unplug our mass airflow sensor. Now the belt cover has a 10 mil up top and this guy has an 11 mil on the side here. Now you just gotta squeeze these clips, pop the belt cover off of the cruise and throttle cables. Next thing we're gonna do is remove the alternator and power steering belt and remove the belt for the AC compressor. First, we're gonna do the alternator and power steering belt because it is in front of the AC belt. So to do that, you got one 12 mil bolt here for the tensioner adjuster that pulls the alternator up and down. You're gonna loosen this bottom bolt off and then once that bolt is loose, you can just loosen up this top bolt which is then gonna drop the alternator and you can pull the belt right off. Then for the AC belt, there's gonna be one 12 mil bolt right down there on the idler pulley. You're just gonna loosen that bolt up and then same idea, you're gonna loosen that bolt off there, which will lose the tension on the belt, and then you can take the belt right off, and you can pull the other two 12 mils for the idler pulley bracket. All right, so we got the AC belt tensioner out. Both belts are out. One thing I did forget to mention on the alternator, you do have to loosen off the mount bolt on this side before you can actually lower the alternator with this bolt. Now that we got both belts out, we're gonna disconnect everything on the alternator by disconnecting the 12 mil on the positive post of the alternator, disconnecting the electrical connector down there. It should be a green connector on most Subarus. Take that 12 mil out there, remove this 12 mil long bolt completely. There should be a nut or a little bracket holding it on the back side as well. And then you should be able to pull the alternator right out. Next thing we're gonna do is get the AC compressor pulled off and the power steering pump. The power steering pump's a little bit tough with the rad in the car, so you can do it after you pull the rad out if you want to give yourself some more space, but it's not that bad. Let's start with the AC compressor though. On the AC compressor, I like to leave the AC bracket in the car because that's what I like to hook my engine hooks onto when we're lifting the engine completely out of the car. I'm just gonna unbolt the AC compressor from the bracket, which all there is is four 14 mil bolts. There's one up top on the left here, one on the right side there, one on the bottom right here, and and then there's one on the inside right there, but I don't know if you guys can see that. The previous owner literally just did not tighten the bolt. You can see the head of it right there. It's just completely loose. So I'm gonna get those three bolts pulled out there since the fourth one's already loose. Then this car has no refrigerant in it, so I'm gonna pull the AC compressor lines right off. But for you guys, you don't have to pull the AC compressor lines off. You can just lay the AC compressor to the side and you don't have to drain any of the refrigerant. So you don't have to recharge your AC when you put the engine back in. Also, don't forget to disconnect your magnetic clutch electrical connector on the AC compressor and unclip the alternator harness off of the top of the compressor.
Just to show you guys outside of the car what I was talking about on the AC compressor. You got your two bolts up top and there's two bolts on the bottom. Then the one bolt I did forget to mention was the bolt mounting the bracket on the side. That's just a 14 mil that sits right in front of your TGV housing right there. And that bolt, honestly, just get a big long extension that comes down from the top and you can zip it right out. Now let's pull the power steering pump out. There's gonna be two 12 mil bolts on the bottom of the power steering pump. You can see one of them right there, right next to the crank position sensor. And then there's one buried at the back there behind your oil pressure switch, which is right under that wire right there. That back bolt is pretty annoying to get at. The easiest way that I find to get at that is to pull all of your purge valves and all your vacuum lines out of here, which all those lines disconnect easy. They're all just vacuum lines, no hose clamps or anything. So you can just pull them off and set everything to the side until you have enough room to get access to that bottom bolt. Okay, word of advice when you guys take this off because I messed up. One thing I did forget to say was just disconnect the little power steering sensor. When you take that back bolt out there, unbolt your purge valve, which is this little guy here. Because if you guys can see, my extension spun on both of those and snapped both the nipples off the purge valve. Now I need to go find one of those off parts car or maybe super glue the nipples back on or something like that. All it is is one little 12 mil bolt to take it off. Honestly, just take the extra two seconds, zip that 12 mil off, take the purge valve off, save yourself that hassle of having to find a new purge valve because from the dealer i think those are like 250 bucks but now that we got the power steering pump set to the side only thing stopping us from setting it all the way over to the side is the throttle cable so what we're going to do to disconnect the throttle cable is there's two 10 mil bolts on the bracket on the bottom there we're going to take those two out and we're actually going to disconnect the cables from the throttle body right there which is also honestly pretty easy to do there's just going to be a little slot at the back that the cable goes into right at the bottom there you probably can't see it very well but this cable basically just goes around loops and hooks in down there. So once you get this bracket off, this cable is going to be nice and loose and you can just pull the cable right out of the linkage to your throttle body. Throttle cables are now disconnected, so we were able to lay the power stream pump to the side out of the way. Like I said in the clip before, we just disconnected those two bolts on the bracket. Then what I actually had to do was disconnect the throttle cable from the bracket. So this one nut is pretty seized on there with rust. So I know I won't need to adjust my throttle cable because I left that nut. I backed this one all the way out until it gets to the loose part of the cable. Then you can slide the cable back and lift it up on that thin point. What I mean by that is on this bracket, once you back the nuts out, you can lift it out of that bracket. So you can separate both throttle cables, lay one to that side of the engine bay, and then slide this throttle cable out from here underneath the cooling expansion tank and lay it to the side as well. So now that's all nice and open. Now we're gonna start to clear up some space at the top of the engine bay, which is gonna be pulling off the intercooler. Pull off the intercooler, you're gonna pull off two 12 mils, one on each side of the intercooler. You're gonna have your couple PCV hoses, just pop them off of this crossover pipe in the three spots. Then you're gonna pull off two hose clamps, one on the throttle body coupler and one on the turbo outlet hose. You can just use a flathead screwdriver to get those off, or you can use an eight mil socket. Then we're gonna take the two 12 mils out on the bypass valve, and we should be able to pull the intercooler right off. Well, boys, this is what happens when other people work on a car and then you start ripping it apart. Look at that throttle body coupler. This guy just jammed the intercooler in there and folded it right over. So I might be able to flatten it out and get the intercooler on and it'll seat itself or I gotta get a new coupler for here. But the intercooler's out. So now the next step we're gonna do for being able to take things apart up top, there's gonna be two bolts on the starter down there and another bolt mounting the starter wire and one little connector for the solenoid on the bottom of the starter. They're two 14 mils, so we're gonna get that pulled out. Then the next thing I wanna do after that is get the clutch slave cylinder disconnected and get both bolts out for the pit stop. And honestly, we'll just take the pit stop right out because it's nice and easy. Then you can jack the engine up and down and not stress that thing out. So the reason I pull the starter out first is because all the bolts for the slave cylinder down there are kind of hard to get at if the starter's in the car. So we're gonna pull the starter out. Then you can get at the 12 mil bolts down there that mount the slave cylinder. And for the clutch, we're not gonna lose any of the brake fluid for the clutch. We're just gonna unbolt the slave cylinder and set it to the side, but that way we don't have to bleed the clutch after we get the engine back in.
starter, slave cylinder, and pitch stop mount are all out now. If you look down there where the slave cylinder was, you can see the two bolts that were mounting it. They're nice and easy to get off once you get the starter out. Starter had the two bell housing bolts mounting it there. And I don't know what is going on with this connector, but this guy has like a pound of electrical tape on it for some reason. So I'm gonna cut all that off. But this is the connector that connects to the starter to engage the starter solenoid. And then down here, this is the starter wire that we just took the little 12 mil off the back of the starter. Now that we got all that disconnected, my next step is going to be to disengage the clutch fork and the thrill bearing. So first things first, I'm just gonna take the spring off of the clutch fork there. Next thing you guys will see down there right where I'm shining the light, there's a little plug for the clutch fork pin and that is a 10 mil Allen key. All you're gonna do is zip that out and if you look inside there, there is a couple threads. On my clutch fork pin, the threads are completely spun out on this one. So I'm gonna have to find a different way to get this out. But usually what I do to get these out is I'll just pull the front bolt out of the intake manifold there. It's a little M6 by 1.0 bolt. Then you can just thread the bolt right into the hole there and then you can pull the clutch fork pin out using that bolt. But in my case, those threads are destroyed. So I'm gonna try and use a set of snap ring pliers, just get them in there, spread them out and then pull the whole pin out. Okay, I got the clutch fork pin out, and uh, if you look inside the hole there, somebody busted a bolt in here, tried to drill it out, and did not fix the threads whatsoever. So what I did to get it out was I just shoved some snap ring pliers in there, squeezed so that, so that it could grip the whole clutch fork like that, and then just kind of wiggled and pulled back, and I got it out. So now that we got the clutch fork pin out, the clutch fork is completely loose from the throwout bearing, and everything is loose in that bell housing area. Next step, I'm gonna get some of the turbo heat shield bolts pulled off, get the turbo heat shield pulled off, then we can start unbolting downpipe, and we can get the top bell housing bolts pulled out. My heat shield on this thing is missing like 90% of the bolts, and the bolts that are on there are just sitting loose, including the one on on this side. She's just sitting there nice and loose and this heat shield was rattling around all over the place. Then all you're gonna do is go around where the transmission bolts to the engine and just find all the bell housing bolts. They should all be 14 mils. There is one here right next to the turbo. Then the starter did have two on it. There's another one down below the starter. But you guys should be able to look around the whole transmission and find those. There also will be some on the bottom, but we'll get to those when we get underneath the car. Turbo heat shields off, and none of the bolts broke, surprisingly. And then I was able to get three bell housing bolts out from the top. And the three bell housing bolts that I got out was one up top here, there was one down just under the turbo, and then I got one that's a little bit lower, it sits under where the starter was. Other than that, the only two that I think are left are the two stud nuts on the bottom. Next thing we're gonna do is get the downpipe unbolted from the turbo. So there's just gonna be a bunch of 14 mils here. There's two bolts that run through the top with a nut on the back side of them and then there's a couple nuts on the studs for the turbo. And then honestly, we might not even pull the downpipe out of the car to lift the engine out. It should be able to just hang out there as long as everything is unbolted here. Now that we got all of the bolts off of the downpipe to the turbo, we are almost done up top for what we can do. We can't disconnect any coolant lines or anything yet because I want to drain the coolant out first and we'll do that once we jack the car up. But now the last things that I'm going to do up top is I'm going to disconnect all the fuel lines, your feed, return, and the evap line. You can just disconnect all three of them from the engine right here. We got to disconnect our vacuum line for our brake booster that goes to the manifold right there. And then just go on both sides of the engine and just disconnect any electrical grounds, connectors, anything like that that are going from the engine to the body of the car. Okay, sick, we're making progress. Everything up top that needs to be disconnected is now disconnected, except for coolant hoses, because we gotta drain the coolant before I make a mess up top, popping off hoses that have coolant in them. So on this side, like I said, the feed and return fuel lines and the one evap line are all disconnected from the engine. Brake booster hose is disconnected from the manifold right on that nipple there. I took the ground off for the battery, off the intake manifold that grounds the engine, and I just got that hanging on the side. Then we disconnected the two main harnesses 
is. And I just tucked them against the oil cap here for when we pull the engine out. Everything is disconnected on this side. The engine is completely separate from the body of the car. Now coming over to this side, we disconnected this main harness connector here, set it with the engine. It's gonna come out with the engine. Then we disconnected our O2 sensor. There's an exhaust gas temp sensor at the back here that I also disconnected. It just plugs in down on the side right there. And then I also laid my O2 sensor onto the engine since I'm not gonna take the exhaust manifold off until we have the engine out of the car. So that could come out with the engine too. So now that we got everything disconnected up top that we possibly can before jacking the car up, let's get the car jacked up and we're gonna drain the coolant out of it. And you don't have to drain the oil to pull the engine, but I'm probably going to because it's easier to drain the oil with the car jacked up than it is to drain the oil on an engine stand. Now that the car's on jack stands, I just bought this thing and I've actually never looked underneath it. So hopefully this thing's not just completely clapped out under there. Before we go underneath, I did want to mention one thing. I can actually see exactly which head gasket is screwed. It is externally leaking. You guys can see all the coolant in there around that head gasket. I'm gonna safely assume that it is the passenger side head gaskets that's screwed. We're gonna do it with both head gaskets, get the heads resurfaced, and reseal the entire engine so that she's mint. All right, first piece underneath this thing actually doesn't look too bad these heat shields on this manifold look rotted right out oh yeah they're all loose oh wow this one literally has nothing holding it on we got the classic valve cover leak onto the exhaust manifold that head gasket's leaking on the passenger side valve covers are pissing oil up top there on the driver's side too then there's a bunch of oil on the frame back here but i don't know what it's from Oh, sick, we got a torn CV boot on the passenger side. Now we need an axle too, nice. But good news is the bellow boots on the power steering rack aren't leaking on either side. Pinion seal on the rack's not leaking and the transmission looks mint. The drain plug is sweating a little bit, but there's no leaks at the back of the transmission whatsoever. And this exhaust looks like it's some kind of custom Canadian tire pipe weld job all the way back. Actually, it's all bent and formed, but it's welded to the factory downpipe. I'm confused right now. It's welded all the way back. I have no idea what brand that is. I don't even think that's a brand. I think that's just a custom exhaust job. So the shitty part about this exhaust is that it is welded all the way to the back. There is no bolts whatsoever to separate this exhaust into pieces. So I'm definitely going to leave the downpipe in the car. Or I guess the downpipe is the entire exhaust. But we're going to leave this on and hopefully I can pull the engine out with the downpipe just chilling here. So let's look at the first things that we got to take off underneath, which there's not much, honestly. On the bell housing here, you guys can see it's a little bit blurry. Won't focus in there, but there's that last stud on the right side. And then there's one more stud on the left side. Both of them are just under the axles so we got to get those two 14 mils pulled out then looking from the front of the engine here next to the oil pan you got your engine mounts there's gonna be a 14 mil just like that on both sides of the subframe one on this side over here and there's gonna be another one on that side right here so you got to zip those two out get those two bell housing bolts out then another thing that's a little sus on here you guys can't see it we'll look when the engine's out of the car but that water pump looks brand new so maybe this thing has a fresh new timing kit in it then on most subarus you would have your avcs grounds bolted to the frame there but this is a usdm ej205 from 2002 so it doesn't have avcs so we don't got nothing there which makes this nice and simple because literally all we have to do on the bottom is the two engine mount bolts the two bell housing bolts this lower rad hose Disconnect the rad fan connectors, which there should be one on each side, one there, and one on this side, but it is hiding behind the coolant tank right up there. Then we're gonna drain the coolant, which on the passenger side, there is a little coolant drain right there. So we'll pop that open, drain the coolant. I'm just gonna drain it into a used bucket because we're not gonna reuse it. And then we can start disconnecting all the coolant hoses. We can pop the oil filter off, drain the oil, and then that should be it underneath. Only other thing I'm seeing under here, which looks a little sus, if you look on the back of the timing cover there, I hope that's not the engine block that's broken, but you can see one of the idler pulleys for the timing belt just chilling there. So I think that's a timing cover that's broken, but we'll see once we get the engine out of the car.
Underneath the car, I took everything that I just mentioned out, disconnected the rad fans, both engine mount bolts are out, both bell housing bolts are out, coolant is still draining, and the oil is still dripping out. I haven't taken the oil filter off, but the other thing I did take off is the block heater cord. Mine is mangled, so I'm gonna have to replace it. And I have a spare one from the STI, so I might just see if that one still plugs in. It should be the same. I'm pretty sure all Subaru block heaters are the same because that car don't need no block heater no more. So the next thing we're gonna do, since everything is taken off the bottom now, I'm gonna get these two bolts pulled out for the rad supports. We're gonna get the upper rad hose taken right out, just taking both clamps off each side. Then I'm gonna go ahead and get the lower rad hose taken off down there. And then she's pretty much ready to pull, boys. Okay, we are finally at the point where absolutely everything is disconnected. The rod is out of the car, rod hoses are disconnected and everything. I disconnected these top two coolant hoses that go to the rad on the passenger side. Then I also went ahead while I was at it in that time lapse and disconnected the two rear heater hoses. So there's one that goes to the hard pipe there and one that goes to the hard pipe down here. I don't know if it was rust or if it was oil that came out of this one, but there was something brown that came out, which is not a good sign, but we already knew the head gaskets were done in this thing. so. The engine's coming out anyways. So now we're at the point where we can lift the engine out. I have this handy dandy engine crane and I also have this chain piece where you can change the angle of the engine while you're lifting it out. So I'm gonna go ahead, run a bolt through this and hook it up to the engine in two spots. We're gonna hook it up on the AC bracket, run a bolt through right there. It's gonna lift the engine from here and we're also gonna lift the engine from this hook right back here for the intercooler bracket. This isn't that strong, but the reason I'm willing to lift from it is because it is bolted down in two spots on either side of this hook so she should be good what we're gonna have to do since that downpipe is still in there is we're gonna have to lift the engine up and then kind of pull it back so that those studs on the bottom there will on the turbo will slide off of the downpipe so let's start by getting the engine crane all set up All right, sick, chains are all hooked up, engine is ready to come out, but it's already getting late, it is 6.30, and I'm taking Sierra out on a date tonight. It's movie night because it is Saturday. Usually Saturdays are for the boys, but I'm being a simp tonight, I guess. So we're gonna go out for a cruise in old Stacy girl over here, and I gotta get these filthy mitts washed up. Let's get a cold start for the boys, and then I'll be back pulling this engine out first thing tomorrow morning or in two seconds for you guys. Okay, it's the next day and we are back, baby. If you guys were following my Instagram, you would have seen us ripping Stacy last night. But now today, this engine's coming out. So we got the chain hooked up. I just used one of the bell housing bolts and one of the bottom bell housing nuts on the AC compressor mount. And on the back there, I just used one of the bolts from the downpipe to the turbo and one of the nuts. Put a couple washers on it and she secured right there. Chain's good to go. Now, I actually got very lucky and when I hooked this chain up, I lifted the engine a little bit and the engine and transmission pretty much separated instantly, which usually does not happen because all I had to do was take a flathead screwdriver, shoved it between the engine and transmission right there, gave it a little tap with a hammer and it separated them enough to the point where now I can lift the engine up and they should separate nicely. So all that we're gonna do for the rest of this is just lift the engine up with the crane, use a pry bar against the engine and transmission to kind of separate them, lift it all the way up, she's gonna come out and then we'll get her set on the engine stand. All right, let's go boys, engine is out. If your guys' Subaru is not as rusty as this one, I would highly advise taking this O2 sensor out on the passenger side of the car because this thing will go right against the frame as you're coming out the entire way. And it is not fun to fight around that, lifting that engine out, but she's out. So next thing I'm gonna do just to get it on the engine stand. And I wanna see if my clutch is fried on this thing. It was engaging good and it never slipped or anything. But if we have the engine out, if the clutch looks rough shape, we're gonna replace it anyways. So for the pressure plate, you're just gonna take off all of the 12 mil bolts around it then the clutch disc and pressure plate should come off. Then you can unbolt your flywheel with all the bolts behind that.
This clutch has lots of life left on it, but I'm pretty sure this is an OEM replacement clutch. It doesn't say Exeti or ACT or anything on it. I think this is OEM. Flywheel is definitely stock. Sick, we could probably reuse all this. They're all 14 mil regular six point sockets on the flywheel. Sick, flywheels come off. Ooh, that rear main's starting to leak too. Good thing we pulled this off. Let's go. Engine is finally out of the car. She's on the engine stand and she is ready for us to tear down and replace some head gaskets. So I'm not gonna make this video any longer than it already is. If this video helped you guys out, make sure to hit that thumbs up button, do all that fun stuff. And make sure you guys subscribe because we're gonna be tearing this thing down, finding out how bad this head gasket is. We're gonna be resealing the whole engine, getting it back in the car, and this winter beater is gonna get beat this winter. So yeah, I hope this video helped you guys out or gave you guys some tips on maybe somewhere where you were stuck. But that's going to be it for this one. Peace out, you guys. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you in the next one.